I'll never forget when I first wanted to try Black Market Eats in Midtown because it happened three times before I actually made my way inside. This was in late 2018. My colleague, lifestyle reporter Dana Dean, did a story on them that went totally viral. So the line was always out the door. The, the shrimp, there's a lot of cool color combinations going in there. We even have a buttermilk fried chicken roll, which is like our paying homage to the Midwest and the South. Just so savory and, and juicy and delicious. You take it out of the wrapper completely? I peel it back just a little bit. You don't have to take it all the way out because at the bottom you'll get that good stuff at the end and there ain't no shame in licking the wrapper. <laughs> if you haven't heard of Black Market Eats, what kind of food do you guess they're eating right there? If you guessed sushi, you're right. If you guessed a burrito, you're right. Because it's both. The restaurant's burrito sushi rolls, with creative fillings, have remained one of the most popular grab-and-go lunch options in that part of town and beyond. Good. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to bring something delicious, fast, fresh, and craveable to St. Louis, and I think we've done that. And sometimes that requires changing the rules. Today on Abby Eats St. Louis, we are getting creative, talking fusion cuisine. And we're taking things far beyond cheeseburger pizzas, taco salads, or even sushi burritos. The country's first Japanese-Italian kosher cafe right here in St. Louis. How the owner got the idea, how the chef makes it work, or doesn't. I mean, th that's the thing about experimentation. Sometimes you're gonna do really awesome, sometimes it's gonna flop, and then you just kinda pick it up and rework it from there. And why the heart of the country might just be the best place in the world for weird food ideas to take off. And that's half the fun, is just playing and creating new things and finding ways to do it just a little bit different. Pancakes will have that for me. And get those, and I'm gonna get the frittata. But I want the turkey breast benedict. <gasps> Fruit plate, I'm getting that. Peter. I'll do the frittata. Okay, I would like the frittata, and you get the Mary Mary pancakes, okay? Okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we get, I don't know what I want. I hate how indecisive you're getting. I'm not indecisive, yes, I just can't are. decide. Once again, Portlandia just gets me. In this episode, characters Peter and Nance are hitting up a new restaurant and the idea of picking what to eat when they get there is literally anxiety-inducing. But honestly, to me, they got the hard part figured out, at least. Where to eat in the first place? Where do you want to go to eat? I don't know. What are you in the mood for? I don't know. What do you feel like? Honestly, anything sounds good. I'm not picky. And so goes every meal date I've ever been on. It's lucky I've been on any, really. The breakfast burger. Great. And the pancakes. No, I'm done with this. I'm just going to be honest with you. It's just such a turn-off when you do this. It is? Womp womp. But it turns out it happens to a lot of us. A study came out last year under the headline, Scientists Uncover Why You Can't Decide What to Order for Lunch. Basically, it comes down to something called choice overload. We have too many options out there. If you like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, being less picky can make it hard to pick. But it turns out our indecisiveness or inability to decide, as Peter would say, might actually be the key to this guy's career. With a broad array of food interests, he decided to bring them all together. And that's a good thing for us. Sure, I'm Matthew Dawson. I'm the executive chef of Cafe Core here in Creevecore, Missouri. The St. Louis native runs the kitchen and masterminded the menu at Cafe Core, which opened this spring. Core, as in Creevecore, means heart. And that's definitely what the owners followed when they decided to open this place up since it's admittedly a unique concept. Um, in, on the East Coast, there is a couple other restaurants owned by one of our owners, um, a, a pizza place and a couple sushi places out, out in Manhattan. And he really wanted to bring those kind of ideas and concepts here to the Midwest. He was actually in a layover here in St. Louis, and he realized that there's nowhere he could really eat because he, he keeps kosher, mm. and there are no kosher restaurants that are open at night in St. Louis. That's so, a very specific request. Kosher yeah. restaurants that are open at night. <laughs> yeah. It, it, now, on the East Coast, they're all over the place. Yeah. They're everywhere. But here in the Midwest, there really hasn't been a kosher restaurant that's open at night for a good number of years, like 10, 14 years, something mm -hmm. like that. So he saw that need, and he got in touch with our other owner, Moshi, who's our general manager here, and who wanted to open a restaurant of similar ideas. So the two of them kind of got together and was like, well, hey, I love my sushi, I love my pizza, let's try to bring it to the Midwest. But really, those two things are very 
polar opposites. They really are, pizza and sushi. That sounds weird, right? Yeah. So what they wanted to do is find somebody who could kind of bridge the two together, the bridge the two styles. And that's when I met them. And I kind of pitched the idea of, well, you know, let's actually fuse the two together. Let's do a little bit of fun stuff. Let's do a little bit of Japanese. Let's do a little bit of Italian. Let's do a lot of intermingling between the two and create just a kind of a cornucopia of awesomeness that comes from the two styles of cuisine. Who doesn't want to dig into a cornucopia of awesomeness? But if we lost you on the kosher part, I'm not Jewish, you're thinking, as you press the stop button, hear us out. Neither is the chef. Kosher is a very healthy alternative lifestyle. It, not just uh, people in the uh, Jewish community keep kosher. Like, I keep kosher, for example, but I'm not Jewish at all. I, really? Mm -hmm, I okay. do it more for, um, for health purposes and for just, uh, it's a good way to live. What I really wanted to do is redefine what it means to be kosher, because kosher is more than just a, a set of rules. It, it, it's actually a, a way of doing food just a little bit better. It's making sure that your vegetables are 10 times cleaner than you would anywhere else. It's going these extra steps and extra miles to make sure that everything is of the highest quality. And so that's kind of what I really embraced when I started doing this project. I'm bringing in all these great cheeses from Chicago that's the highest level of kosher cheese in America. It's called Holly Sorrel, which um, what, what it means is basically that um, Someone's been checking it from the moment the animal was born all the way through till it was milked. And when it was milked, the, the, cheese, the rennet that they put into the cheeses is not just a normal rennet. It's actually very specific for kosher standards. And it just creates a higher level, a higher quality of cheeses that you're really going to find anywhere else. So it's really, really cool. So give us a quick lesson in what it means to keep kosher. Well, um, kosher, so... Most people think of kosher, they think of the, the simple ones, no pork, no shellfish, um, stuff like that. Now, Is this where you can't meat have and dairy. meat and dairy, yeah, yes, yeah, so no cheese on the burger. That's correct, <laughs> and, and there, there's a little bit of symbolism involved in it as well. Like, for example, um, milk it represents life, you know, the mother uh, feeding her child, uh, that's giving life to the child. Um, the flesh of the animal represents death. Uh, obviously it's a dead animal, so you don't want to mix life and death together. So there's a little bit of symbolism involved in it. Um, apart from that, it's just a certain level of standards, like um, you, you don't want to have bugs in your food. Um, the only kosher that bug... That would not be no, good. No, not at all. There, there's, there are a couple kosher bugs. They have to have jointed legs and wings, so like, say, a, a locust, for example, could be considered kosher. I really? Think. Uh, like a cricket would, or, or a grasshopper, not a cricket, a grasshopper would be considered kosher. Huh. Um, but most bugs are not because they don't have a jointed leg and they don't have wings. So like thrips, your flies, your, your, um, your fruit flies, that sort of thing, th none of those are kosher. But they're in all produce, right? So we take 10 times extra steps to make sure no bugs are coming in whatsoever. Hmm. We actually w wash them, rewash them, check them over a, a light box to make sure there's not a single bug anywhere within the, the produce. So it's just extra steps. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one of those things where even if somebody doesn't, you know, obviously there's not the religious connotation with yeah. organic food, but for example, you can keep organic or you can just know that it's a healthy other yeah. option. I'm keeping out shellfish, which is really the worst type of seafood for your body at all, right? I mean, it is shrimp. They're bottom feeders. They're living on the ocean, eating whatever everything else is leaving behind. I guess I've never thought about it that way. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it, it's just another way of thinking of food. Um, so we don't have shellfish here. We, there's no shrimp, there's no crab, there's no lobster, there's none of that. Um, all of our fish are kosher fish. Tuna, salmon, sea bass, stuff like that. Um, those are all kosher fish, and so we have all that. Um, and since we're a dairy restaurant, we have dairy, which means we do not have meat. So there's no beef uh -huh. here, there's no chicken here, obviously there's no pork here because pork is not kosher at all. Yeah. Um, and the, the meat standards is cloven hoof and choose its own cut, so cows are kosher, pork is not. So while kosher is much more than a set of rules, it's still a set of rules. So when it comes to the fusion of Japanese and Italian, seems like that's just a total free-for-all, right? Maybe not. Honestly, it's not as out of the, out of the wheelhouse as you might think. I mean. 
Japan in, in general kind of is a little bit like Western cuisine as well. Um, when they opened up the doors to the world and started embracing everybody coming to Japan, they really embraced all the food that was coming on, into their borders. Interesting. So, I mean, you get your noodles from China that you see in Japan all the time. I mean, when I think of Japanese cuisine, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is sushi, right? But to me, the first thing that comes to mind is ramen. What is ramen? Ramen is noodles from China, broth from Japan, and everything else from wherever they can grab it. And that's what makes it awesome because it's not, it's while it is tr traditional Japan, traditional Japanese, it's not. It's a little bit of Japanese, a little bit of Chinese, and a little bit of every other Western influences that's hit the shore since then. And, and that, when you think about it like that, Italian cuisine really melds the same way. Like, I love these little Italian cafes in Japan that you walk in and you get a nice cup of coffee and a pasta you've never seen before, like a, a pasta Napoleon is one of my favorite things, which is basically like spaghetti with uh, red and green bell peppers and onions and mushrooms and a kind of uh, ketchupy soy sauce sauce all mixed together. And that's a, a standard dish you would find in most Italian restaurants in Japan. Huh. Now, here in the, in the Midwest, you will never, ever see that anywhere, right? No. But that right there is a little example of a fusion. Right. Uh, I just like to take it to the next step. If you're still having a hard time figuring out how this all goes together, so were we. So producer Dory and I tried some of the most popular dishes, beginning with the matcha linguine, house-made noodles with a matcha cream sauce and pecorino cheese with egg yolk and a togarashi, which is a mix of Japanese spices. It's creamy, smells delicious, and because of all the matcha tea powder, it's green. What you want to do when you get the dish, the first thing you want to do is get your fork and just crack that egg yolk and start mixing everything together. Here's the thing that's already standing out and I haven't even taken a bite, is that you unroll your silverware and you have a fork mm -hmm. and chopsticks. I don't yep. think I've ever been in a place where I am trying to eat linguine with chopsticks. Which, but you absolutely could if you wanted to. You could do either way. Yeah, that's the great thing about it. We, we want as many options as as possible for everybody. I like it. Dory, you gotta get yours out here. Try this. I want you to try this with me too. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh, so you say I should so crack yeah, the egg yolk. Crack first. the egg yolk with your fork, start <gasps> mixing that around. Is there anything more beautiful than how the egg yolk looks when it oh, first? Oh, absolutely. I'm doing this with my left hand like a goon. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. Looking pretty. Okay. And so the egg yolk adds a bunch of richness to the dish, which is already a very good, rich dish. Mm hmm. So you can just grab and dig on in. You're being brave with the chopsticks. Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm doing it out of a sense of you know honor what? and I'll, duty. I'll do it too. There you go. Just so we can have some fun. Yes. Sorry, I don't write it. No, really go. Mmm. That is really good. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't know if I would have been able to identify the specific flavors. Mm hmm before, yeah. if you wouldn't have told me about it. Yeah, but when you get in there, you get that nice richness from the matcha. The, you can taste it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And matcha, I remember, mm. kind of blew up as like a super food mm -hmm. a little while ago, right? Absolutely, it did. Mm. Excuse me. Hey, this Chewing. is the one place where you can talk with your mouth full. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, matcha's huge, and it has so many different uses. It's full of antioxidants. It's, it's full of ev everything good and really nothing bad. I've been using it at my house for years and years. Um, mm -hmm. Smoothies, ice creams, pretty much anything. Yeah. Put a little scoop in some hot water and drink it down with lemon. Is my are my teeth turning green? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Not yet. I feel like they might. <laughs> okay. Tell me about Frito miso. Think of the Italian fried dish like calamari, except with different <laughs> types of mushrooms marinated in a Japanese-style broth. Please try it. Yes, I want to try one of these. Lots of herbs. Um, Japanese mayonnaise on top. Mm. The cherry panna cotta, an Italian jello-like dessert, but That's flavored good. with cherry and coconut. I like it. The arancini onigiri. I had to practice saying that one a couple times. That sounds like an Italian word and a mm -hmm. Japanese word if I've ever heard it. <laughs> it definitely is. Arancini is, a, arancini is about as Italian as you can come. It's a fried risotto ball. Ooh. So cheese and rice, all breaded and deep fried and just awesome deliciousness, right? Um, and onigiri is kind of the same thing, but in Japan, they're more served for lunch. 
Okay. Um, you'll see them filled with, it's just basically a rice ball filled with things like meat or bean jam or sesame or whatever and formed into triangles and then they put a, a piece of nori on the bottom to hold it. Mm -hmm. Well, so I took the same idea and just put the two of them together. I, the, you got the arancini, which is the cheese and the rice, and then I shaped it like an onigiri. Then I breaded it and deep fried it because, you know, St. Louis loves deep fried. Yeah. And what I, really, I wanted it to look kind of like a toasted ravioli. <laughs> I see that. Mm -hmm. so, so I served it like a toasted ravioli, yeah. marinara sauce, pesto, and uh, grated Parmesan, but it's all rice and cheese. Huh. I'm going to have to test that one. Okay. So tested and true, this fusion is delicious. Oh, this is my fork. Okay. But fusion can be a complicated term in the food world. Some see it as a creative opportunity. Others think it's gimmicky. I asked Chef Dawson how he feels about it. I, th I think fusion is a word that people are familiar with. They get the idea of combining a couple items, and so that's why I use it. Uh -huh. But I, I don't really think of it beyond, beyond that as just something that's familiar and, and approachable. Um, what I wanted to do with the cuisine is really just take some really great ideas, put them together, and make some really awesome food. I, I, labels are something I always kind of shy away from a little bit. Do you look for common ties in foods, recipes, oh, cultures, absolutely. that kind of thing, and absolutely. go from there? That, that's really where I go. So anytime I'm creating a new fusion dish, the first thing I think of is, okay, where is it coming from? Is it a Japanese dish? Is it an Italian dish? Okay, and then I start breaking it down from there. I start deconstructing the dish and think about what it is and its base components. From there, I think, okay, Let's say we're doing a ramen dish, for example. Ra ramen is noodles um, and broth and meat and vegetables, if you really, really break it down to its bare bones. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, noodles are also Italian, so let's, instead of do ramen noodles, let's do spaghetti noodles. Um, broth is very easy. Now, uh, in Japan, tonkatsu broth, which is a pork broth, is pretty standard for ramen. Obviously, I'm not gonna use that because it's not kosher. Um, what am I going to do instead? Let's say I'm going to do a vegetable tomato stock instead. Because veggie stock is everybody and um, Italian tomatoes pair is great. So let's take it one step further. Smoked tomatoes. Let's do a smoked tomato broth. Okay, so smoked tomatoes, spaghetti noodles. I've got two components so far, but it needs something more than that, right? It really needs a good protein. What's a good solid protein? Um, salmon's great protein. Salmon uh, is pretty, used pretty, pretty, pretty heavily in Japan. Um, not so much in Italy, but they'd use tons and tons of fish, especially southern Italy. So it, it does kind of work in that. So let's put some salmon on that. Um, what goes with that from there? Well, we got to have nori in it because every good ramen dish has to have nori yeah. in it. It has to have a jammy egg in it because every good ramen has to have a jammy egg. So, okay, let's do that. Let's add some, some more Italian vegetables to it then. Let's roast some zucchini, maybe some eggplant. Put that in there, there as well. Put it in the, on the plate or in the bowl, sit it in front of somebody, and you have a fusion dish spaghetti ramen. Did you just come up with that on the fly here? Maybe. Were you freestyling? You were freestyle fusing right there. Yeah, why not? It's, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun to play around. Do you feel like having all of these, so say you want to put, okay, if you want to define this mm -hmm. as Italian, kosher, Japanese, mm -hmm. do you feel like that gives you enough room to play? Do you think it gives you more, too, yeah, it, too it, many shackles? No, it, I think it gives me tons of room to play. And we don't always, every single dish doesn't, have to be exactly Japanese and Italian. There can be some play and some wiggle room. That's half the fun, is just playing and creating new things and finding ways to do it just a little bit different. And that's really the essence of what I want to do. Something that's unique and fun, maybe a little tongue-in-cheek and silly, yeah. but also be exciting and beautiful to see on the plate. And You want to come back and have that second dish and that third dish and keep coming back over and over to see what's new and what's different. And that's really what kind of what I wanted to do with this. Um, I do tons of off-the-menu stuff. I actually have a secret menu that's floating around. That if you follow us on social media on, or uh, Cafe Core STL on Facebook, um, you can see uh, pictures of our secret menu. And the only way you can order these things is if you know about them. Yeah. The only way to know about them is to follow us on social media. I think we've all been in the position where we have random ingredients in our mm -hmm. fridge. Um, 
leftover noodles, mm -hmm. uh, maybe some barbecue sauce that we really like, mm -hmm. and a block of cheese. Yeah. That's all from personal experience. This is actually a recipe that I created. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure I threw an egg on top of it, too. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I was so proud of myself, and I ate it for leftovers the next day. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I would have the courage to put something that um, out there on the menu like this. I think, how do you realize what you're making that's so different than what a lot of people have would have thought goes together? How can you recognize that something is good versus maybe a flop and you just like it and it's not the best idea? Well, you know, that's part of playing, part of having fun. The, um, I always, anytime I make a new dish, the first thing I do is start feeding it to people at random. Hey, you're, you're here. I know who you are. We talk, we've talked a few times. You want to try this new dish I'm playing around with? So experimentation is a great thing. I, I love to do it. And I always spend at least an hour a day doing that. And um, so then I just find guinea pigs and I have them try it out. And they like it, they don't like it. We, we can go from there until I find that perfect, um, the, the perfect amalgamation of everything. And then I put it on the menu. I love it. Have you ever served something up to people and they were like, oh, dear goodness, please do not serve this to people? Yeah, oh, sure, absolutely. There's like what? A, there's always playing. Like, uh, oh, I don't know. Years ago, I, I was trying to mess around with uh, octopus and scallops and, and a kind of honey sauce, and it just didn't work out. It and sounds good. It I sounds, can see where, yeah. you came, where you're coming from. I, yeah, and I mean, that, that's the thing about experimentations. Sometimes you're going to do really awesome, sometimes it's going to flop, and then you just kind of pick it up and rework it from there. But there is here in St. Louis. It's Chef Dawson's home, despite the fact that he's traveled the world and experimented with all sorts of different types of cuisines. And he says St. Louis is the perfect test kitchen city for whatever he comes up with next. Oh, I'm always thinking about that. I mean, St. Louis is my market. These are my people. I've been, I've, I was born in St. Louis, raised in St. Louis. I love St. Louis. Um, I love the food scene we have here. I think we're one of the best food cities in the nation right now, and that's awesome. And so I, I always want to play a little bit true to my St. Louis roots and have some things that, oh, I've been living in St. Louis my entire life. I don't really know Japanese food, but hey, here's something that I see and I recognize and I definitely want to try. So, so have an access point for mm -hmm, people. Exactly. And those access points open the door to something unique and different. Okay, well, I, I tried something that's very familiar with me. Next time I come back, I'm going to try something that I've never heard of before and see how good that is. Oh, that was awesome. i got to come back and try the next thing. So it's really, it, it's a way to build build a, not only a following but just a, a, a bond with my customers that they're seeing things, some of them they're familiar, some things they're not, but they always want to come back for more. And that's really what I want to do. I want to create that bond, that, that level of friendship with everybody that comes in here and tries these cool, unique dishes. Because isn't friendship just the best kind of fusion? Ooh la la. Ooh la la. Ooh la la. Abby Eats St. Louis is a Five on Your Side production. I'm Abby Larico. Executive producer is Dory Olmos. Our theme music is by Olivier Renoir, Jerome Fabi, and Pierre Dubost. Portlandia is a production of IFC. You heard a segment from the Brunch Village episode. Special thanks to Candace Coleman and Dana Dean. Join our conversation on Instagram because we want to hear from you. What kind of cuisines would you like to see fused? And let us know about the food news you're curious about. Be sure to follow and subscribe. And until next time, seize the plate. So we're getting ready to wrap up the podcast interview and producer Dory so swiftly reminded me that we hadn't tried the dessert. So I want to let Dory <laughs> bite into that because she was the astute one who remembered. It's too pretty to ignore. It I is mean, pretty. It's so beautiful. Okay, here we go. Ooh. The cherries and coconut, you can't go wrong. That's true. Okay, okay. I'll try it after Get you. Get in there. I touched the coconut. Mm, now I get the fruity taste to it. Mm. The texture is something that I like, but I can see people being unsure of. Yeah. However, it's nice and cool, and like the flavor is it comes recognizable. Through then, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, like a Jello or a, a custard. You yeah. Know? <laughs> mm. 
It is good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you can accidentally eat the whole thing way too fast, I feel like. Wouldn't take too long, either. 